uh, you know, ethnic federations or in anything like that. It is the detractors of the federal system uh, that uh, as, you know, ascribe this terminology and impose this terminology on it, mostly uh, to deride it, to uh, call it like tribal, uh, parochial, uh, um, anti-Ethiopian, um, and so on and so forth. But the, the word used in the constitution is uh, nations, nationalities, and peoples, and it has got a history. What it actually says is that Ethiopia is a nation of many nations. There is a famous constitutional law author, the guy who actually drafted this constitution, his name is Fasil Nahom. He wrote a book in 1997, two years after the adoption of the constitution, which is entitled A Constitution for a Nation of Nations. That tells you that that is a, really a country of many nations. And um, people like me who studied Ethiopia's federalism, Ethiopian constitutional law for a long time, would like to describe it as a multinational federal structure. The multinationalism is, it comes from the fact that there are many nations trapped in that country. Now, the people who call it ethnic federalism to kind of allude to the negative tendency, fragmentative tendency, cessationist tendency of small sub-state groups within the country are basically people who subscribe to the ideology of imperial times. The ideology of the imperial times says that Ethiopia is one a, a nation of one people or a country of one nation. And um, this has been uh, criticized and found wanting for many years since the 1960s. And the reason we have this language of nations and nationalities and peoples in the constitution is because in the 1960s, the student movement realized that the imperial project of creating one nation out of many is a failure. The, the imperial project of trying to create one nation out of many by dissolving all the distinct national identities and subsuming it under the Amhara uh, national identity, which goes as the default Ethiopian national identity. That project is a failure. It wasn't inclusive enough. It was hierarchical in its relationship. It was... Uh, uh, at the expense of the other peoples of Ethiopia. One author calls them the other peoples of Ethiopia, other because they are other to the history, other to the political space, and their identities is not anywhere to be seen in the Ethiopian political landscape and cultural landscape. So the other peoples of Ethiopia were marginalized, um, uh, erased, and they were not visible. And some of the people who now criticize the constitutional setup, the multinational federal constitutional setup as ethnic, as tribal, are actually failing to see that the imperial project of creating one nation out of many, instead of preserving many nations within one, consensually, um, that th that project has, has failed. Haile Selassie's project failed. It is because of that. Uh, that it was basically uh, Haile Selassie was dethroned, uh, the monarchy was deabolished, and the diversity of the country's nations and nationalities and ethnic groups was recognized. And between 19, 1974 and 1917, when the uh, Mengistu Haile Mariam was in power, virtually all opposition against Mengistu's regime was coming from these different ethnic groups, different national groups. The Romo Liberation Front, the TPLF, the Eritrean People's Liberation Front from the north, um, the Somali, the Oga, everyone. And when Mengistu failed, what failed once again, resounding, was that imperial project of creating one nation out of many instead of preserving many nations in one on equal basis. Let's look at the Oromo. You understand uh, the Oromo people and the Oromo struggle. What is the end game for the Oromo people? Because that might help us understand what the other nations within Ethiopia are feeling. Yeah, the, the Oromo is one of the nations that basically saw that the imperial project is unsustainable. 
Um, it is unsustainable because the Oromo constitute the single largest group in the country, about 40% of the population, one third of the territory. Um, the attempt was to dispossess Oromos, to displace the land and the culture, the language. Uh, some bit of linguistic imperialism was there, some bit of cultural imperialism was there, and fragment them and kind of disperse them and um, make sure that there is no Oromo nation as such that will survive the Ethiopian imperial project. But the Oromo nation refused to, to accept that, to be assimilated, to be displaced completely culturally. The language survived. And over time, uh, it, it led to the, the organization of national, the, the establishment of a national consciousness that led to the organization of um, Oromo uh, Liberation Front, which led to the armed struggle. And finally, in 1991, it prevailed over Mangustu Haile along with other groups, the TPLF in Dikrai, the ALF, the APLF in Eritrea, the ONLF in Somali, and everywhere. Okay. The OLF, uh, once the OLF came into the picture and Oromia was established, recognized, Oromos and all other nations in the country were recognized for who they are as a collective groups with the right to self-determination recognized in the constitution. Um, then it was said that this time it is going to be a consensual coming together of peoples. So the many nations that had issues before with each other, the nations that were hierarchically secondary before are now coming, coming together to be owners, co-owners, co-founders of the state, the Ethiopian state. And once the collective agency is restored, the right to self-determination is recognized. It will be a free association of independent nations. In this situation where everyone is co-equally a founder, co-owner of the Ethiopian state, the end game for the Oromo is to have it to have a democratic dispensation in which, at least through democratic votes, large because they have got the they constitute the largest uh, group in the country, they will not be losers in a democratic Ethiopia. So they kind of suspended the interest to secede. And that's the case with ONLF, the Ogaden, that was the case with TPLF which had actually prevailed over the state, they could have seceded back then when Eritrea seceded. That, they said that's not the end game because in a, in a democratized Ethiopia, in a federal Ethiopia, where all nations are recognized, collective agency is asserted, and self-determination is recognized. And people can walk away unilaterally if they so wish through a referendum. All right? If that is the case, cessation doesn't doesn't is, is not anything that we aspire for because to be together and exist in peacefully coexist peacefully with others will actually harness the energy in the region and create a stable ethiopia which also creates a stable horn of africa and so on and so forth so for a while the oromo and the other nations have had suspended the interest to go away but now where is it going even the fact that this war has simply uh, pushed Tigray out of Ethiopia, literally. It is very difficult today to look at a Tigrayan in the eye and say, you know, we need to collaborate and work together in Ethiopia. It is very hard because every kind of evil has been perpetrated for the last five months and more, and no other group, no other region from among the nine could somehow stand up to Abiy Ahmed and say, no, this is not happening. So they, they are in despair now. They said, we don't want to have anything to do with Ethiopia. And mind you, the Tigrayans are the co-constituents, the co-creators of the old Abyssinian kingdom, which became the Ethiopian empire at about the end of 19th century. So once Tigray steps out of Ethiopia, uh, there is no way that the Oromo would now say, hey, I, I have to take the burden of, of preserving Ethiopia uh, for the Amhara. It it's, it's just unthinkable. So now people are beginning to consider, to consider so, after Abi, what? You know, what? So do we still try to work for Ethiopia or do we want to form our own state? But this is not spoken about clearly, but people are considering this as an option.
So given the history that you've described, do you think that the Ethiopia project as it is now can hold to have one super nation with a group of nations with this ideal of um, coexisting and a great deal of self-determination? Is that genuinely possible given the tensions that are playing out? If we disarm, demilitarize the politics, because the, the question of, you know, the, the war in Tigray is a political war. It's about politics. It's whether the Ethiopian core wants to subjugate the peoples of the periphery, you know. And if this is, you know, if this is political, then you have to find a political solution for it rather than a military solution. In other words, if the Ethiopian government, whoever controls the center, first demilitarizes the politics. Secondly, democratize the state, get into election, an inclusive, free, fair, and competitive election. Even if you want to succeed, if you have that as an agenda, once you have a government that has a democratic mandate, you can table Article 39 of the Ethiopian Constitution, which talks about self-determination. And then you can legislate towards a referendum, and then the people would decide. But if two things, demilitarize the politics, disarm your arms, and democratize the state, meaning um, ha- be inclusive, sit down and negotiate, talk about a roadmap towards electoral democracy, have that election, and say everything else is going to be played out as per the constitution. If we do this, the Ethiopia project will, of course, succeed. It, you know, it lacked only one step in 2018, which was having a democratic uh, uh, opening for once, a democratic election. Once people have that opportunity that they can make or break their governments through their votes and they can go out when they so want through a referendum, through a vote in a referendum, and when they know that nobody is going to turn the tanks against them for deciding whatever is politically plausible for them, Ethiopia project would have worked and it, it would have become a genuine voluntary association among the disparate groups in the country. But now, in a state of democratization, we have gone into a restoration of the imperial project that pits everyone against each other. That's why you see the Amhara National Regional Government going everywhere, trying to fight all the wars that Abiy Ahmed is fighting. It is an assertion of there is the attempt to restore the politics, to return the politics of empire. If the politics of empire is to be played, and if military tools are going to be part of the political game, then the project, the Ethiopia project, might as well be collapsing right before our eyes as Tigray uh, decides its destiny and the rest of Ethiopia either dissolves into a war or a civil war, an interminable civil war at that, or um, the stronger ones come out and unilaterally declare their independence. But I still am a believer. Demilitarize the politics, have a democratic state, have an election, you know, just pull out the arms out of the politics and the political equation, let it play on a popular constant basis. Ethiopia is a viable project still. However, given the level of despair people have, given the level of muscle flexing coming from the from Addis Ababa and the, the clamoring for hitting them, hitting upon them and killing them, murdering them, etc., from the Amhara Special Forces. That's the kind of n- noise we hear every day in the name of Ethiopia. If that is how it is going, muscle flexing from Arakilo, which is the center of the, the palace, um, and uh, show of force from the Amhara region and militaristic politics, as long as we pursue this, probably the Ethiopia project is not going to survive this time because people are really desperate. People are really mutually 
um, mutually suspicious of each other. So we have the Prime Minister, Nobel Peace Prize laureate. He himself is Oromo, I believe. Surely this is a man who would understand uh, some of these uh, nation within nations tensions and the need perhaps to find that middle ground. Why is he having difficulty in doing that? Well, he uh, is a self-identifying Oromo uh, person. Um, he was born and raised in Oromia. And um, we, and that's why he's also a member of the political party called Oromo People's Democratic Organization. And that's the party that catapulted him into power. And so for all we know, the Oromo People's Democratic Organization is a political party that struggles for the freedom, equality, and social justice, achievement of social justice of Oromos, uh, for Oromos. But uh, given the fact that he came on the back of the Oromo protest movement, promising uh, to address the demands of the Kero uh, Oromo, which is the young people of Oromo who were in Oromo protest, well, one would have a hope that this time uh, the Oromo will be centered rather than alienated and marginalized. Unfortunately, Abiy Ahmed on the aftermath, on the very first day he assumed power and on, in his inauguration speech, he unleashed the politics of empire. What, that day, one of the things he said is, now is the time for the return to the glory of the olden times. And as I have just told you, pre-1974, Ethiopia's nations have an uneven relationship, a checkered relationship. One scholar calls it a ranked relationship. There is a first-rate citizen, there are second-rate citizens, and most of them, some of them are in fact slaves. The darker-faced people were seen as slaves. Okay, and those it, it, this race racialized kind of differentiation still plays out when you see the violence in Benishangul Gumuz. When people refer to the darker faced peoples of Ethiopia as Shankella, which is blacky, if you like, which is the slave, you know, the, the, in the past it was the blacky that becomes a slave. So there is a racialized hierarchic relationship among the groups of people in Ethiopia. When you talk about return the glory of the olden times, everybody knows that pre-1974, this is a country of citizens and subjects. Some are citizens and others are subjects. And people were immediately picking up on that statement and saying, what glory are you talking about? And for all we know, even Ethiopian scholars describe Ethiopia's legal history, Ethiopia's political history, as the agony and ecstasy of Ethiopia's history. There is an article by Ivo Straker the agony and ecstasy of Ethiopia's history. What does that mean? For some, it is ecstatic, the glorious. For others, it is an agonizing history. No one, most Oromos who's, who hear me now would say, this guy is not even an Oromo. This is Ethiopianist. The reason is because an Oromo, because of the agony vis-a-vis -vis Ethiopia's history, we don't even, wouldn't even raise this issue and talk about the Northern history of Ethiopia. So, um, Given the fact that this is the nature of relationship in Ethiopia, when he said, this is a time for us to return to the glory of the olden times, that moment he ushered in what I call the return of the politics of empire. From that moment on, through collaboration with other Ethiopianist you know, mo uh, parties, which, are, which I consider to have a no an imperial nostalgia, really, in collaboration with them, he basically railed against, number one, the multinationality of the country. Number two, the federal structure of the country. Number three, the self-determinationist constitution. So he said, we are going to change this. We, he said, excesses, excessive nationalism is destroying the country. Therefore, we have to move away from identity-based or nation-based politics, and therefore we don't have to insist on such political parties which are liberation fronts, etc., etc. When he began that, he had immediately veered away from his Oromo constituency. 
and the Oromo automatically disowned him. First of all, they didn't know him before. He came under the shadow of Lema Magarsa. And secondly, the politics he plays is precisely the politics that the Oromo has been fighting for years. And he came at a moment when the Oromo considered themselves at the cusp of victory after all those protests. He came basically to, 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 as a counter reform measure, if you like. So we say in among the Romos now that the revolution is hijacked, the struggle has been stolen, and now and, and the, the victory has been redirected to bring in not a democratic reform, but rather a return of the politics of empire. That's why Abi alienated himself from the Oromo constituency. The second thing, and that's where he happens to have only these wars to manage ever since he came to power. The reason he is fighting with the Tigrayans, the reason he has his uh, fighting a war in Oromia now, is because he said to destroy this identity-based politics, the most difficult fronts are Tigray and Oromia because they've got liberation fronts who sacrificed immensely to make sure that in the very list, they will have an autonomous self-governing region within a federation, in the very least. When you talk about no need for um, identity-based politics, ethnic-based politics, or whatever you call it, uh, sometimes pejoratively, when you say there is no need for this, for this and I'm going to change, or I'm going to uh, stop this, that moment, what you cannot stop is the nationalist sentiment in Oromia, in Tigray, among other places. And because there have been fields which have been uh, struggling, rallying around the liberation fronts, he said, we have to crush these two. So I think six months into his reign, he launched a war of eliminating the Oromo liberation front from Oromia. And two years after he, he assumed power in the name of law enforcement, he launched a war against Tigray. And it went on. He had done the same in Sidama. He had done the same in uh, Laita. We were looking for a statehood within the Federation. And there had been, there had been violence, violent uh, repressions in those places. About 157 people were killed in a day in the Sidama region. Uh, um, although they, later there was a referendum and they, they achieved their statehood and on and on. So it is his posturing um, and his propagating the nostalgia for empire that is alienating from alienating him from the Oromo public and becoming him a disowned uh, constituency less individual figure now. And, and I'm going to focus on the Oromo people just because of their size and significance, and you understand them by being of that nation. Um, is it, are all Oromo on the same page in terms of the way forward? We've seen the military wing of the movement move away from the political wing. So one gets a sense that even the Oromo are not agreed on the way forward for the Oromo nation. There are many Oromo political parties. Um, there is, for example, the Oromo Liberation Front. There is the Oromo National Oromo um, Federalist Congress. And there are other smaller parties which uh, almost are disappearing nowadays at least between these two and uh, the third is of course abi himself abi part abi's party itself which has transformed itself from a nation-based party to i don't know what mm -hmm. uh, to a prosperity party now um so at least the two major parties have one thing they agree upon the very minimum thing that Oromos as a nation expect uh, in their uh, life in Ethiopia is to be a self-governing state within a federation. The protest over the last many years wasn't about for cessation per se. It was for self-rule primarily. If this is a federation, then we need to be governing our region without any interference from the national from the government of Malaysia now and the others. Um, and it is about being benefiting from our own resources. It was about having 
a pride of place for our language in the country. You know, they, they thought the Oromo language to be a co-working federal language, the working language of the federal government. Uh, these were the kind of questions they were asking. If you, if you look at these things, um, and of course, protection from eviction, arbitrary eviction, protection from loss of land and abuse of our environment and so on and so forth, access to their own city, Addis Ababa being an Oromo city, but Oromo being uh, virtually pushed out, literally evicted from the places and so on and so forth, dispossessed and displaced from the city. Um, these were the kind of questions they were asking. All these questions, if you sum, sum, up, sum, you, if you sum, up, sum them up together, there will be one thing, social justice. They 